we have to look back now. We, we look at so many other communities that honor the past. And sometimes I think we haven't had the time to say we need to honor our past. And it may be crumbling into the soil, but it was there and we have to remember and lift up the memory, if not the institution. This is Belmead on the James. Over 2,000 acres of plantation land where enslaved people once lived and were laid to rest. But I'm here for what it became post-Civil War. A massive campus of Catholic-run boarding schools. The St. Francis de Sales High School for young ladies on one side and the St. Emma Military Academy for Native and African-American boys on the other. Oh my gosh, I'm holding history right now. 127 years old. 1895. When the school opened. The heiress and nun, St. Catherine Drexel, founded the schools beginning in 1895, with St. Emma, in particular, becoming the only black military academy in the country. The school has since shuttered, closing its doors in 1972. Currently, the Bellmead property is privately owned. Local historian and photographer John Plaschel periodically holds tours and lectures with alumni here, and he gave me a private tour of what remains. Where are we right now? So you are in the mansion on the former Bellmead Plantation in Powhatan, Virginia, which the St. Emma cadets would know as the Big House. How long has this place existed? This building was constructed in the 1840s when a Confederate general who lived here had it built. Built by the very people he enslaved. The property's varied history of ownership from Native Americans, a Confederate general, to a Catholic nun, among others, is only a part of the reason John is compelled to share its story. You seem drawn to telling this story and, and enriching the lives of others with the history of the hallowed ground on which we're on right now. Why? There is a gap in history. I'm, I'm mentally trying to comprehend how a place like this with its history has no recognition. There's no plaque here, there's no commemoration, there's no museum. That perplexes me. And that conundrum of mine was accentuated after I met the cadets. Today, the property is eerily quiet, devoid of the life and sounds that once permeated these halls. So it's time I met a few former students myself. Outside of Atlanta, I sat down with Roger Bruce, Bruce Dobbs, class of 71, for a trip down memory lane. So where are we right now? We are at Bell Mead Farms, and the reason why we named it Bell Mead, it's a beautiful piece of property. It just kind of reminded me of it. You're both smiling right now. First memory that comes to mind. Driving up on campus and having other cadets greet my parents, and then as soon as my parents left, they dropped my foot locker and, you know, I went to get my head shaved, so. Okay, yeah, tell me about that. What is it, what is it like? What time do you wake up? Take me through a day. 5.55. You're out on the blacktop, going through the drills and doing all the things you have to do. This is all before class starts. What was free time like? It was free time, but I wouldn't call it free. Okay, <laughs> why not? Even that was somewhat uh, routine. You know, you had a certain period of time uh, for class, then you had, you know, homework, you had military exercise in the afternoon as well. We always laugh about it, you know, it was like during the day because it was a Catholic military school. So by day they were teaching you to love your neighbor, at night how to kill him. <laughs> so <laughs> We were in charge of ourselves. There was students managing other students. I was a battalion executive officer. I was like number three. But each senior officer had a day 
when they were responsible for running the school. And so you, you garnered those leadership qualities that really help, help us today. Look at these, what he does today. Years of hard work culminated with cadets receiving three diplomas, a stellar education by any means, but their experiences taught them so much more. They would not let us really ride the bus. It was unsafe for us to ride the regular buses during that time. So when we would go home, they would charter buses to take us you know, back to New York or wherever the, the, the kids were from. And there was a place along the road called Maryland House. We're sitting at the counter waiting on them to serve us and white folks standing behind us, and they were ignoring us. So Father Figo asked us what we wanted to do. You know, he, he didn't like it. He couldn't tell us to tear the place up. But he just kind of said, what y'all want to do? And then he walked out. And you can imagine what happened after that. And we got on those buses and headed on back out of there. But it, it was just a situation where we were learning as young men how to defend yourself, how to uh, understand what the environment was, and then do what you needed to do to survive in that environment. Survival is the main thing that I think I got out of St. Emma. And it's not only surviving, but it's also, it's also thriving, being perseverant. I can't say enough about Father Figaro. He's a commandant of cadets, African-American priest. Which was rare. Which was very, very rare. He caught a lot of flack because uh, he was serving mass in African robes back in, you know, 1966, 67, 68. You know, he was really before his time. We, we had a visit one time. We laugh about this, too. There was a visit by the military, and Father Figaro took the black, red, and green flag, and that was flying up on the flagpole with the U.S. flag. And the general came on the campus. He was like, <laughs> what the? Is that. Yeah, is that. <laughs> Father Figaro taught us to do what you feel like you need to do to show that you are proud of who you are. On the opposite side of the Bellmead property, the young ladies of St. Francis de Sales were being instilled with similar values. Today, the school building and chapel are all that remain. And this is just half the puzzle. This is just the St. Francis side. So this is where the ladies studied. It opened in 1899 and was operational for about 71 years. Paul, oh, look at that facade. All of the stained glass in that chapel was designed by Mother Catherine herself. And she just had this incredible attention to detail. St. Francis alum, Henri Monteith Treadwell, class of 1962, looks back fondly on her time here. I'm sure you must remember what the, what the chapel yes. was like. Beautiful. Beautiful. I, the entire experience was inspiring. The good thing about it was that it didn't make you feel that you were better than anything, but it did make me feel that I was certainly as good as and maybe had an opportunity to do more because of that special experience. The strength Dr. Treadwell built during her time at St. Francis would help sustain and push her to conquer challenges ahead. You were a part of integrating. I mean, you were the first black person to attend the University of South Carolina. I was the one who filed the lawsuit and I was the one where the judge said, she's gotta be allowed to enter but no African-American woman had ever graduated from the institution. How do you think attending St. Francis helped really shape the trajectory of, of your life? It helped me to become a strong and independent person. And when I left there, graduated, and moved on, to ultimately the University of South Carolina and the integration there, I think that really, it served me well to have been away, to have not been leaning on people, but rather leaning on my own inner strengths. There's so many young ladies that graduated from here that went on to have successful careers and uh, 
almost all of them universally attribute their success in life, professionally and personally, to their time here at St. Francis, all of them. Nun and former school nurse. Sister Jean Marie Craig. When I was here though, I was Sister Mary Eva. Worked at St. Francis at the time it closed. And I was a school nurse and I did the driving for the sisters in some study hall and that type of thing. And then two years later, the physical education teacher got a new job in Washington, D.C., where she was from. But she didn't tell us in time to hire a teacher. And so I was told, you're the only one for you and be the teacher. And so uh, for the next few years, I did teach physical education. Then I left here and went to Xavier University to get my first degree in health and physical education. There were kind of signs that were going to close. We began to not take so many students. The uh, junior class, if I'm not mistaken, was 20 students, which was very tiny. And the freshman class was only seven. We got to the point where we permitted the sisters to select what she wanted to do. You know, so people at that point did not want to be teachers. I would say that's one reason, because the sisters were at that point permitted to do pretty much what their heart said they should do. Um, and I think people saw at that time, we closed our schools, quite a few schools in the 70s and 80s. And now, we, now we're only 60 Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Back in 1960, there was 614. Both schools were closed by 1972, and most of the buildings bulldozed. Decades after closing, these few buildings are all that remain. When the schools closed, most of the buildings were torn down in the 70s. The buildings at St. Francis stayed up, but they were not in good repair after a few years of um, not too much care. So in the year 2000, a group of Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament got together and said, okay, what can we do with this beautiful place? And for maybe 15 years, a group of sisters worked and restored the property, did a lot of restoration. By 2019, the sisters had decided that it was time that they had to close the place, they had to sell the property. and. Uh, so that's what they did in 2019. And uh, it's regrettable, but you know what? Well, it does go on and we have moved on and we don't have the land, but we have the stories. So here we've got some vintage images to share with you. And I know that you interviewed Bruce and Roger, here is the very parade ground that they used to march on when they were teenagers. Look at that. Today, historian John Plaschel says an exhibit in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History is in the works, but he wants more. What's your goal? My goal is for the cadets and the young ladies of St. Emma and St. Francis to feel a sense of fulfillment. What does that look like? You can say inclusion in the Smithsonian Museum of African American Culture, that's a great step and that's something they're working towards. But I think it's gotta be something permanent. Things that are gonna occur on this property when they're long gone from this earth and I'm long gone from this earth. And the only thing that I think that can do it justice with a permanent commemoration is a museum, a brick and mortar museum, either here or somewhere else for people to always visit down the road and for them to see it in their lifetime. In the meantime, dwindling alumni of the schools share their stories while they still can. I can remember the program that we had in music and parents had come, I guess may have been a graduation or something, and my ability to be one of the soloists and I still um, almost makes me tear up. Um, can remember that special. Almost every night I think of that. 
That was special. Yeah, we, we were there when, when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Yeah. And we were supposed, the school was supposed to take a trip to, yeah. to Richmond, Virginia. And Father Figaro made that announcement that night. Remember? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, Martin Luther King had just been assassinated. Locked down the entire school. Nobody went off campus. St. Emma is a, um, I just hate that it's not here anymore. And I hate that there's just not something that replaced it. We need to honor our past. We owe something to those nuns and their families who funded these institutions long ago. And maybe our debt is just to say, we remember, we are grateful, and we want you to know it.